All right, well, um, welcome everyone to the uh, uh, second part of the um, technology track. Um, the irony, if you watched uh, Marcus Sabadello's first talk in this track is that I really feel the, our two talks should have been reversed uh, because he went quite far down deep into uh, the presentation at uh, the uh, uh, the specifications and the standards and the, the 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 state of a number of things. I'm going to cover a few other things that he didn't, but uh, I won't go probably as deep on a number of the uh, specific projects that he talked about. Um, what I will do though is uh, paint a higher level picture of explaining the uh, DID architecture and so where each of the standards fits, what is needed for us to achieve uh ultimately interoperability and i will talk about that quite a bit at the end of marcus's presentation there was a question about i, I you know what is it going to take will the various different standards converge so that we have an overall interoperable global did ecosystem and uh, I personally believe that we will get there and that it, it won't take, you know, it won't take a very, very long time. It will take a number of years, uh, I think probably at least five, but we'll, we'll talk about that more um, at the end of the presentation. But what I want to do is paint a picture of what it is that we do need to standardize. And I, and I will talk about what is done and what is left to do. So um, <clears throat> just a little bit about myself. Um, uh, those of you who have known me in the context of uh, Evernim, where I have been chief trust officer since uh, my startup, Respect Network, was acquired by Evernim uh, over five years ago. I think it's almost six years th at this point. Um, <clears throat> so I've been working on DID, SSI, decentralized identity. Uh, for that entire time. And Evernim was just acquired by Avast, A-V-A-S-T. Uh, the main website is avast.com uh, to become part of the new digital trust business there, uh, whose leader is named Charlie Walton, uh, who was formerly the VP of identity at MasterCard and uh, he, he left MasterCard to join Avast last May to, uh, to take over there and build out their new uh, identity division, which is completely focused uh, on decentralized identity and also integrating it with uh, the existing identity and access management systems, IAM systems uh, around the world. So, uh, I work <clears throat> heavily on the uh, specifications and protocols and standards necessary for this space. Together with Marcus, we've been co-editors on the uh, W3C decentralized identifier specification for the last two and a half years. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm one of the co-authors of this book on self-sovereign identity. And I want to give a shout out to Benny and his other uh, translation partner um, who did the Korean translation of this book uh, that is about to be released. Benny can share more about that in the, uh, in the, in the chat. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm very excited about it coming out in the, in the Korean market. There's also been a Chinese uh, translation that's also coming out this spring. Um, <clears throat> I'm very active in the Trust Over IP Foundation, which I will tell you more about, um, including the Governor's Stack Working Group. So, that's enough background. Um, let's let's dive into this. Um, oh, I just talked about the book. I, for, I forgot about that. Um, it is available entirely online, um, or you can get the printed. If you if you get the print edition, you get access to everything that's online. So, and I do like to point out, fifty four contributing authors. Um, in part because of the pandemic, we ended out. Um, uh, taking much longer 
to complete the book about twice as long as we had planned. But what it meant was that where there were many more people in the industry that were able to respond to our invitation to contribute. And we had so many chapters that we ended out basically maxing out. It's a 500 page physical book. So we added another 11 chapters in the, uh, what are, what's called the live book edition. And, uh, and that's, those are only available online. Uh, but the good news is the live book can continue to grow and dynamically uh, reflect um, additional chapters or updates, which we hope to have happen over the next couple of years. All right, so <clears throat> um, my talk is going to be in three parts. First, I'm going to paint a big picture of DID architecture. Uh, uh, using slides that I, many of you have seen before, I'll try and, and, and keep it uh, simple and, and current. Uh, then I want to really talk about the trust over IP stack and how it brings everything together into, uh, with the goal of interoperability. And then lastly, I'm going to do a quick survey of the state of the different standards involved. And all the links in this are going to be in the PDF uh, that we're going to share here. Um, so you don't have to you know, take screenshots or, or, or notes on, on, those, uh, on those links. So let's start out about did uh, architecture and how it is about more than just uh, wallets and credentials. Right. <laughs> so we'll start with did architecture. And uh, uh, I, I usually start out by explaining there have been three overall eras of, inter of, of internet identity, the centralized era where the key problem we had to solve was how to, how to have an encrypted connection over the internet so you could safely use usernames and passwords. But the pain of that led us to the federated identity where you could reuse a username and password for one site to log into multiple sites <clears throat> through federations. And now with, uh, for about now five or six years have emerged the third era of decentralized identity inspired by blockchain, but not exclusively using blockchain as we'll talk, and the two core standards of DIDs and verifiable credentials. And these are the key organizations involved with each of these three um, uh, eras. Now the two, as Mark has covered in some depth, two fundamental standards, verifiable credentials that became a full standard at the W3C in September of 2019. Decentralized identifiers became what the last step before a full standard called a candidate recommendation in March of this, uh, actually of last year, I guess. Now I realize it. Um, and uh, is now uh, pending the uh, final vote as we'll discuss at the end of this presentation. So <clears throat> this is all the basics that everyone already knows about how, um, you know, the goal. The, the, the important thing here is that when we first started, you know, talking about digital wallets and credentials, it was very early on, uh, the major initiatives that are being discussed at this conference in the EU, in Canada, uh, in Australia, uh, in other countries around the world, some of the smaller countries, um, and of course, in private industry are really reinforcing that the era of digital identity wallets and, and digital credentials has arrived. Um, the specific example I'm going to talk about today, I'm not going to go into depth because there's going to be another talk uh, uh, in the business track later on. The whole talk is about the IATA travel pass. Um, but I think it's a wonderful example if you really want to understand uh, digital credentials and wallets. This is a full end to end solution uh, for providing your uh, travel information and together with um, a, a digital um, proof of your vaccination certificate or a of a COVID test in order to take an international airline flight. Uh, IATA is the International Air Transport Association. This app is from them. Um, uh, Evernim and now Avast is the supplier of the underlying, um, you know, wallet agent technology um, that. Uh, that was used to build the app and, and powers the uh, credentials. And this is now in use by um, a couple dozen airlines. It, they're adding more airlines um, you know, every week, uh, using it on more and more routes. 
to try and simplify this problem of how do you prove your travel documents and your COVID tests. Um, it, it takes in multiple credentials. Uh, your, the, the wallet will actually verify your passport. Um, it does a scan and then a check and then converts your passport into a verifiable credential and then takes your COVID test result or your vaccination certificate and makes that a credential. With those set of credentials, you can uh, provide a proof to get on a plane, uh, to enter an airport, um, and the goal is to have those credentials also be recognized by border authorities, and IETA is working with governments around the world to do that. So that's the example we're going to use as we go through talking about the overall architecture. Now, these are slides, again, many of you have seen before, so I'm going to go relatively quickly. Um, if you want to dive into the details, they're all in the book. Um, <clears throat> This is the, uh, the famous trust triangle that applies to all credentials, whether or not they're online. Uh, they all have issuers. They go to holders to keep in a wallet who present them to verifiers. Now, when you do this online, the trick is this, uh, of course, you're doing this digitally with digital signatures, but the trick is this verifiable data registry here in the center. That's what we're using to decentralize the PKI, the public key infrastructure that allows the signature of the issuer to be ver on the credential uh, uh, to be verified by the verifier. <clears throat> so if we want to walk through that, and this is where we'll get to where the specific standards apply, this, here's the trust triangle, here's the wallet in the center. Now, issuers and verifiers will typically also be holders of credentials. In other words, in a full decentralized identity ecosystem, almost every party will be a holder and a verifier, and many of them will be issuers, including individuals. We will issue verifiable credentials of, of, of things that we are authoritative for, like our preferences, um, you know, our personal profiles uh, of information that we, you know, we are the only uh, source of. We'll issue credentials for that. So, <clears throat> If we walk through the, the trust triangle here, the issuer, if it's going to issue a credential, wants widely verified, uh, a publicly verifiable credential is what I call it, then it writes uh, a DID to some system that's generically called a verifiable data registry. That's the term in the specifications, both in the verifiable credential specification, also in the decentralized identifier specification. They both use the same term. Many examples are blockchains, but it's not the only thing that, that will work. It's whatever will work for the issuers and holders and verifiers in a particular digital trust ecosystem. So the issuer uh, writes what we call the DID document uh, and that establishes the DID, whether they generated it or it's generated uh, in the transaction with the verifiable data registry. And the DID document will contain the public key and any other cryptographic metadata necessary to issue verifiable credentials. Once the issuer has done that, they can now issue as many verifiable credentials as they need. They will all contain the DID of the issuer. And what the issuer does is with the private key, they digitally sign those credentials. That's how the verifier will prove they're authentic. They're issued to the holder and they go into their uh, digital wallet. Now the holder can go to a verifier and uh, present what's called a proof of the credential. And we, the reason we call it a proof is because the proof may not be a, simply a copy of the credential. And we'll get into the privacy reasons for that and the standards that are needed there. But one thing the proof will do is share the DID of the issuer. So the verifier can take that DID, use it to look up the DID document from the ledger, and with the public key, they can now verify that proof. And the power of this architecture is, um, you know, besides a cryptographically authenticated uh, uh, proof going to a verifier, there is no integration needed between the verifier and the issuer. The verifier needs to trust the issuer, or it doesn't matter that the proof verifies. Um, the, the, the verifier won't be able to rely. But as long as the verifier trusts the issuer, 
in for whatever purpose the verifier is requesting the proof they need, then if it verifies, they know it really came from the issuer, it hasn't been tampered with, it was issued to the holder, and everything works. <clears throat> now, if we take the IATA travel pass, just to uh, take a real world example, uh, IATA um, is, is, is authorizing different issuers, testing labs, and, and healthcare providers around the world. Those issuers, I think there are over a thousand of them now, testing labs around the world. Each of them writes a DID to the sovereign blockchain that is um, uh, a special purpose, uh, you know, uh, a fit for purpose blockchain designed for DIDs and did documents. Um, then the testing lab can now issue a travel pass uh, health credential um, to uh, the holder and they digitally sign it. The holder as a traveler can now uh, issue uh, or present when a verifier requires it, like getting on an airplane, can present a proof of that credential to an airline. The airline will use the DID and that proof to uh, read it from the sovereign blockchain and verify that proof. And again, no integration is needed. This, can, this is a highly scalable system uh, for any number of holders for, for, you know, in the case of, of IATA, hundreds of millions of, of um, travelers per year will be able to use the IATA travel pass system. And there are over, I think, 180 airlines in, um, in IATA. So, so that's, that's a good example. Now, uh, I want to take a minute before we go into the standards to talk about the special role of privacy by design in this architecture, uh, because it's taken a lot of work to, uh, to put these protections in place and they're not understood uh, as well as they need, I think they need to be. Thankfully, customers like IATA do understand them and that's why they've, they've chosen to use them. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a quote from Anne Kavukian, uh, the, the mother of privacy by design who who recognizes that it's the best chance we have to implement privacy by design at internet scale and uh, here's why so this is the same diagram we've just been looking at and this did is being written again to a public blockchain in the case of uh, sovereign and iata but the interactions that take place up here are not they don't use public deeds. When, when this holder and the issuer um, uh, uh, connect to, to, uh, to request and uh, obtain a digital credential, they exchange a different kind of DID. Uh, we call it a peer did, and it's private and pairwise. Each party generates a key pair, and from that, a DID that's unique to that, uh, to that relationship and exchanges it with the other. It's called the peer did protocol and it is being integrated into uh, the didcom standard that mark has talked about so and that's one set is established for this relationship when the holder and the verifier first connect they also exchange peer dids but it's a different set and th these peer dids do not need to be shared with anyone else they don't need to go on a public blockchain they only need to be shared and they can be authenticated between these two parties so you have a private um, uh, secure channel here and a separate private secure channel here where all the messages can be authenticated by the two parties in both directions. That means that the exchange of credentials that takes place up here in the triangle, all of this is off chain. It doesn't touch any blockchain, public or private, and all of it can be fully compliant with the European General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR. So this is a, uh, this is a very important point and I wanna emphasize what it means is that blockchains as one solution for verifiable data registries are very, very, you know, very powerful and very useful there. But above this line in the private peer-to-peer -peer interactions, not only are blockchains not needed, they're not wanted because they don't fit 
the peer-to-peer uh, -peer privacy that's needed there to be compliant with GDPR, and just generally to protect the privacy of these relationships and exchanges. So that's our, my first key point about privacy architecture. Now there's a second one I wanna share, and that's the rule of zero knowledge proof cryptography. And I'll pause for a second for the translators <laughs> to get that across. ZKP for short. And uh, I just wanna impress, it is plays a really important role in this overall privacy architecture. Uh, and, and, and here's why. <clears throat> if you want to issue credentials from, from which holders can, can provide zero knowledge proofs, I'll explain why they want to do that in a minute, it starts within the wallet. You store something that's not a, 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 um, a key pair, a, a public-private key pair. Rather, it's, a, it's like a private key, but it's a long private number called the link secret. And when the holder requests a credential from the issuer, they actually create, it's called a blinded version, a derivation of that link secret that's unique to that one issuer. That issuer uses that to issue a zero knowledge proof encoded credential. It's used that blinded link secret to give the holder a credential that only the holder has. And what it means is the holder can now produce a zero knowledge proof of any of the information of that credential, including just a proof that they have the credential and not reveal anything in it. I can prove, for instance, I have a US passport. I'm a US citizen, by the way. Or I have a Washington state driver's license without having to share anything in it. Now, I can also take that driver's license and produce a proof that I am over the legal drinking age to go into a bar without sharing my birth date. These are all examples of what we call selective disclosure. So I can selectively disclose just what the verifier needs to know, and they can ask me for just what they need to know. But even <clears throat> just as importantly, the digital signatures that I'm gonna share are not correlatable either. When conventional credentials that do not use zero knowledge proof cryptography, the, the signature of the issuer and the signature of the holder, if they're signing it, are universal. They're like tracking beacons on every credential that's issued. This is why zero knowledge proof is very important from the standpoint of privacy protection and why, uh, why Evernim is, and now Avast has been concentrated on it. Uh, and for instance, why IATA wanted to use it for the IATA travel pass. All right. Um, I'm just briefly going to touch on the fact that well, how do you know the holder really is the holder, even if it's their wallet, but someone else could be using that wallet, they could be using that phone, they could, they could, uh, you know, have stolen the phone or, or uh, a child could be borrowing it from a parent, whatever. To get to that, you then, of course, need some way of proving the um, uh, who is at the phone, liveness detection, biometrics. You see this list here of, of sort of the escalating set of choices that you have for applying biometrics and liveness detection all the way up to out of band verification, such as a video call. Um, all of them are possible. Um, Evernim and Avast have been adding, uh, I've already have implemented some of these. We've added support for uh, facial re recognition and liveness detection. Um, and I think that most of the sophisticated digital wallets out there, the government grade or commercial grade digital wallets will incorporate these features. They also can be very privacy respecting if the biometric stays on the local device and what you're getting is a proof from the device of a match. And so I'll just finish on this section by saying, this means with these technologies, we can have cover the whole spectrum of very public credentials that are not privacy preserving, you know, uh, uh, organizations, corporations, governments that need that need to be widely recognized all the way to highly privacy preserving credentials for sensitive data, health data, financial data, whatever it might be. Uh, all right, my last uh, point, again, for many of you who may have seen this before, it's the same. Same diagrams. It's the last time I'll be using this set of diagrams because we're preparing new ones 
uh, at Avast. Um, and that is to talk about the role of governance frameworks. The, the trust triangle is great as far as it goes, but scaling it to a large population of issuers and verifiers, such as those for the IATA travel pass, is a real challenge. The solution is to add a second trust triangle we call the governance triangle and produces the governance diamond. And uh, that's the governance authority. It doesn't mean it's a government. Government is one kind of governance authority, but it could be a consortia, it could be a company, a university, uh, a, a smart city, uh, any, any, whoever needs to establish and maintain a digital trust ecosystem is the way we put it. And they publish a governance framework, a human readable document of the policies and rules that this ecosystem will follow. Now, this pattern is very well known. One of the you know, largest networks in the world, MasterCard is a governance authority for a payment network where they authorize all the banks to issue a credential called a credit card to cardholders who can then use that credential, call it a proof of that credential at any merchant. Now, of course, that's a payment network, but MasterCard was one of the founding members of the Trust Over IP Foundation because they saw this same architecture can now apply to decentralized digital identity. Um, and you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, MasterCard is a very centralized entity. What makes this decentralized? Well, two things. One, that credential, when, it's, when it goes into a digital identity wallet, is now something the holder can use anywhere, not just on the MasterCard network, if it's an identity credential. That's point one. Point two is there can be hundreds, thousands, millions of these governance frameworks out there and holders can participate in as many as they want to establish the digital trust relationships they need. So that's what makes it ultimately decentralized. Now, if we take IATA Travel Pass, it's exactly the same diamond, except now we're not talking about payments. IATA is the governance authority. The issuers that we talked about before are the testing labs of those uh, uh, COVID um, uh, tests. Holders are travelers, and now they can use those with airlines. And again, one governance framework with the policies publicly published. Everyone in the ecosystem knows what the rules are. And you can certify against those rules, and you can audit against those rules. And my co-chair at the Trust of RIP Governance Stack Working Group, Scott Perry, We'll be hosting uh, the final session in um, the uh, business track on um, um, the challenges to SSI adoption for, for businesses. <clears throat> so let's see. Well, I think we're doing pretty good. Uh, have about 20 minutes left, and I'm on to part two, which is uh, how now do we take these standards that we need for the architecture we've just covered? What's a path to global interoperability? And in short, this is why we, we founded, um, uh, there were 27 initial founding companies um, and four initial working groups of the Trust RP Foundation. And the reason we did that is because we said, this architecture supports a stack. And it's not just a technology stack, a four layer technology stack. That's what you see on the left side of this diagram, but it's also a governance stack. Meaning if we want a interoperable trust layer for the internet, that's as interoperable as the network layer that established the internet and the web layer that you know put, put uh, web pages and hyperlinks on top of that, then we need a standard set of protocols that everyone can use, just like we have with the TCP IP stack that made it interoperable at the, uh, uh, at the network layer, at the data layer. The difference is there were no, there, the, there was minimum governance, I'll put it that way, necessary. All folks had to agree on was essentially the routing tables and eventually domain names. That's why we have ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, that is the governance body um, that, that's necessary for that internet layer. But what ICANN has not been able to do is deal with the trust issues we have on the internet. And we believe that to do that, there can't be one 
big governing authority, right? There are thousands, tens of thousands, millions of digital trust ecosystems in the world. They all need to have managed their own governance. It needs to be decentralized. What we need to do, as much as we need to standardize the technology, we need to standardize the models for the government, for the governance and how um, people and machines can make decisions about interactions between different trust communities. And that's why we propose to standardize the models for these governance frameworks as well. So why is, why is it four layers in this stack? Uh, I think I've just explained why it's two halves. Well, let's take a look at why it's four layers. It turns out any modern digital, any, excuse me, any modern technological infrastructure follows this four layer pattern. It even applies to our ground transportation infrastructure. If we look at that, the bottom layer, we would not be able to either um, drive on the roads that we drive on uh, every day, um, or if you use air transportation, take airplanes around the world were it not for the airports, you need at layer one. Inherently, they're public utilities if you wanna create public in infrastructure that can be used by everyone. But that layer will not do anyone any good if there's not the private equipment that then you need to use that infrastructure. Either it's cars and trucks and, and motorcycles at, at layer two for, transfer, for, for uh, ground transportation, or it's the planes that uh, um, are, are powered by, you know, bought and operated by airlines around the world for the air infrastructure. Now, again, that won't be enough unless you then add the rules of the road, right? Literally, um, the, the traffic regulations, stoplights, signage, and everything necessary for ground transportation, or of course, air transportation, we're talking air traffic control, and all of the rules and cooperation that's necessary to produce that. Once you have those three layers, then you can finally deliver the applications and services on the top layer. And I like to point out, even when you're talking the transportation industry, right, just ground, you know, trucks and cars and physical things, there is a digital version of that industry that's, uh, you know, I have Uber there, but it could be Lyft, it could be any, any number of the ride sharing companies. They're now digitizing that infrastructure in order to make it more efficient. So these four layers, again, they apply to almost any large scale public technology based infrastructure. What we're doing at Trust Over IP is saying, ah, we need to apply them to our data transportation infrastructure. And if you go up layer by layer, you can see the analogy. At layer one, what we need is the public utilities, those verifiable data registries where you can cryptographically anchor um, DIDs, the documents in a utility where verifiers will be able to look them up and rely that yes, that information is authoritative. It really is from the verifier. It hasn't been changed and it's long lasting and you don't have to talk directly to the verifier to get it. Layer two is that private equipment that we're all gonna be using, only it's not cars and trucks or planes, it's digital wallets and the agents that uh, are operating those wallets and making the peer-to-peer -peer connections that we talked about. And they need governance frameworks to cover the privacy, security, data protection, so you as an individual or, or a company using an enterprise wallet can be sure that it's meeting their uh, requirements. Layer three is the trust triangle. That's where you need to, uh, you need governance around the, what credentials are being issued by what issuers, for what holders and what verifiers and meeting the, their policies and requirements. This is where the kinds of operating rules that Visa and MasterCard use fit right here. And all those three will now support the digital trust ecosystem, the applications that are the ones that people and businesses and the internet of things will be able to use to deliver the ultimate value propositions. Um, and the richest form of governance framework is called an ecosystem governance framework. Um, and <clears throat> I'll talk about the standards for those here in just a minute. So to, to wrap up this section, this is again, the reason we're up to, uh, I think we've passed 300 member companies now at Trust Over IP and another uh, like 125 individual memberships. And by the way, Trust Over IP membership, either individual or um, uh, corporate organizational, 
is available at the contributor level for free to anybody. You just have to agree to you know, the intellectual property rules uh, there. Of course, you can become a general or a steering member if you want to help support the work there, but uh, we want to make sure everyone feels uh, comfortable and, and can tackle that there. So our focus, our mission there is to build out this stack and uh, to then, uh, as, as we, and, and again, I'll cover the state of it, but as we, as we have those definitions, then help produce interoperability test suites and, uh, and, and, and the, 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 the necessary uh, education such that it can uh, move towards broad adoption. Now, <clears throat> that's right. Uh, so, so you can see you know, our, our mission statement there. I wanna clarify that this diagram helps show we don't create any, uh, we don't do any work on standards or protocols uh, itself that we don't have to because that's work that's happening in all these other organizations. Um, our goal is to assemble it all again into that interoperable um, uh, suite and stack that will help us drive the same kind of interoperability that TCPIP achieved for the internet. So that's why I'm maybe more optimistic than Marcus or others. It's because of the work going into this at Trust of IP, which I'm happy to say is accelerating. You know, over two years, uh, it's taken us a while, but let's now go into this final part of the presentation. Again, I wanna leave time for questions. So I won't be going into the depth that Marcus did. I'm gonna give you uh, just sort of a state of the art of where the standards are on both sides of the stack and then let you either ask questions or uh, or, or drill down, um, uh, you know, after that. So a quick way to, you know, to, to ask the question, well, what needs to be standardized where? All right. So layer one, the primary thing we're talking about is DIDs and DID methods. DID methods are, DIDs are a standard for how you can come up with the uh, cryptographic verifiable identifier and a method for writing it and reading it uh, and updating it on a verifiable data registry. It doesn't say specifically how it's done. That's a did method specification as Marcus covered. And there are over 115 of them now registered at the W3C. So there are many different ways of doing that, um, but it's, it's uh, the, both the dids, the did the specification and did methods are what need to be standardized. Um, and on the uh, uh, on the governance side, it's what we call utility governance frameworks. The next layer, it is this did to did communications, um, and and we'll cover what protocols are being developed for that. Third layer, verifiable credential formats and exchange protocols. A lot of folks are not aware that only the formats and signatures are covered by the W3C specs. No exchange protocols are standardized yet. And layer four, there are different uh, functions and features, primarily trust registries and reputation systems that are what are in demand uh, in ecosystems. Now, again, all of these, um, even if you have standards at each of these layers, um, unless you actually create an interoperable stack, you're still gonna have interoperation issues. And not just in technology, then again, you need interoperability in the governance such that you can rely on those things. And that's where those two come in. All right, so I'm gonna quickly just for, through the four layers, give you a snapshot. I'm not gonna go deep into this because I wanna leave time for questions. So uh, as Marcus explained, we are, uh, we do have, we're done <laughs> the DID working group uh, last two and a half years. Uh, this is a link to the controversy, um, I just, put it that way, called the formal objections from three of the browser vendors that you can read more about. Hopefully that's gonna be resolved this spring. There's also a spec for a W3C dead spec registries, but that's still going to evolve. What we still need to do, uh, Marcus has been leading the work on did resolution as a separate specification. Hopefully that will also become another, um, another working group W3C. Almost all of those 115 did methods need some updating to be uh, compa compatible, conformant with uh, the DID spec. And then there are other technologies like carry, uh, key event receipt infrastructure that uh, need to define what they call carry tunnels to do the same thing. Uh, on the governance side, 
Uh, we do have good news there. In fact, it's the same good news for all four layers. Um, the trust over IP has issued the, the V1 governance architecture and we'll call the governance meta, uh, meta model spec. Both of those are links directly uh, to the two. Uh, if you just Google either of those two names, you'll get the blog post that Trust Over IP put up two weeks ago about all those. <clears throat> we still have uh, a lot of work to do on um, the, the uh, uh, governance frameworks for the many 115 did methods. Some will, will have them, some won't. Uh, Trust Over IP has a utility foundry working group uh, for anyone who wants to work on a community of practice with others on those things. And the, the governance stack working group is now wanting to create a standard template for trust over P layer one governance frameworks that's, that will be available to any utility that wants to use it. All right, popping up to layer two, wallets and did the communications. Um, good news, Didcom V2, I was on the call earlier uh, today it's almost done. Of course, they've been saying that for about three months now, but I truly think it is very close. There's a new user group available at didcom.org. Uh, I highly recommend it. It just opened its Discord um, uh, discussion channel where it's going to be holding weekly meetings uh, in, a, in a new format where the meeting's actually going to be a, an asynchronous meeting for 12 hours. So we'll have an agenda and people will pop on on Discord. And, and, and so it doesn't matter what time zone you're in around the world, you'll be able to virtually participate. They will then drop in calls as needed, um, but but that's gonna be going. And then Kerry, as Marcus mentioned, uh, is now uh, headed to IETF. Um, that's that's an effort that's underway. So, uh, you know, I'm being optimistic that it's almost done. There's still a fair amount to do there, but it is getting uh, fairly robust. Um, as soon as Incom V2 is done, the, the, the point is, it's, it also is going to go to ITF. Um, I'm just broadly calling it Incom V3. I don't know what will be involved there. And uh, I trust over P, we will need to be creating a layer two interface specification that will turn around and say, hey, if you want to be interoperable, this is what you need to support a layer two. Governance side, again, same thing. We have the overall specifications. What we need to do is a layer two governance framework template with standard um, uh, roles and, and processes for uh, wallets and agents, uh, whether local, uh, local device, mobile devices, or in the cloud. There are three um, verifiable credential forms and exchange protocols. Uh, Mark has covered this in some depth, so I'm not really going to go into it. These are all existing uh, you know, uh, uh, specifications. There's a lot of work in progress, including uh, there's a, a, a format called ACDC based on uh, carry and the work on BBS plus Mark has covered. Um, there's an effort just starting to, to uh, um, specify the non creds format that's been in, uh, supported by Hyperledger um, Aries project uh, from the outset and now now folks are saying, hey, let's standardize that format because it is, it is the most advanced EKP we have right now. BBS Plus will eventually supplant it. And then as Mark has explained, the whole Verifiable Credentials 2.0 effort. On the governance side, same thing. And we need a layer three governance framework template. There's already work that started on that. Uh, so, so I don't think it's too far away. And I'll wrap up here at layer four, uh, ecosystems. Uh, we have a trust RP, a uh, basically a, a beta uh, trust registry protocol specification. Uh, over in the EU, the ESIF uh, lab has a train specification, which is more um, more robust um, uh, trust registry and discovery specification. Um, and there's also uh, ACDC is doing chain credentials to solve that same problem. Um, <clears throat> and we have a bunch of work to do there on discovery and rich reputation. And on the governance side, once again, what we need is we need uh, the layer four. Oh, interesting. I just seem to have triggered some kind of a, sorry. Um, there, there we go. I just, I clicked on, on one of these links and so it, it, it took off uh, layer four template. So that's it. That is my, uh, again, Marcus's presentation actually goes deeper into a number of those uh, more advanced uh, uh, areas of specs. So I encourage you, if you didn't hear that before, to uh, yeah, to listen to the recording of that that'll be available or, or download Marcus's uh, presentation.